Thanks, Beverly, for being on the show again with us. Remind everybody who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, Andy, thank you for having me um, at, again. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's great. It, it was great to connect with you. Um, so I teach and develop, I developed a course and I teach a course called Asphalt Anthropology, which specializes in helping people navigate through dense public spaces. Um, it's a self-defense class with a very particular niche, if you will. Um, and the goal is to really help people uh, build skills so that they can navigate their just their day-to-day -day lives with more freedom, joy, and boldness. And I know we're going to talk about fear today, and that really kind of gets at the heart of one thing that I'm quite often countering in asphalt anthropology is, is kind of mitigating, um, you know, not mitigating, but like discerning fear, mm -hmm. uh, what's real, what's not. So that's at the heart of what I do at asphalt anthropology. Very cool. And I mean, and that's, it's a much needed curriculum. I think everybody probably could benefit from taking the course. How did you get started doing this? It has been a long evolutionary journey, if you will. Um, I started in the martial arts and the self-defense world over 30 years ago. Um, I was in high school and started with a Taekwondo school. And um, I, I started because I love it, have continued. I've gone on to earn a black belt, a second degree black belt in a system called Cheyenne Ru Martial Arts, which is a more of a, a traditional uh, Asian style martial art. Um, but I've done Krav Maga for about 10 years. I, my favorite styles are boxing and um, more recently I've been involved in judo and competing there as well. Um, and that's been my first love. And then as a woman in that space, it's kind of, you, you kind of get asked a lot to, hey, will you put together a self-defense class? And so it was um, kind of by default, it's not like a really like glamorous story or anything. I was just kind of there and, and, and they, and they're like, you should do this. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, once you start teaching folks and, and sharing your stories, their stories and, 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 and pr providing skills, it's something that just kind of hooks you. And so I've been involved in that, in that world for about 30 years. Um, and in those classes, you know, traditional, what I call mainstream self-defense classes, what I've been doing most of this time, um, you know, it's the traditional, you know, how do you get out of a grab? How do you, you know, throw a good punch? How do you, you know, use your voice in a powerful way? How do you, you know, what's situational awareness and, you know, kind of all those general things. But then a big thing happened, which was about 10 years ago, I moved to Los Angeles and I found that all the things I had learned and all the things that I had been teaching really weren't very relevant in so many ways. Um, not to say that there's not value there. Um, there's tremendous value um, in learning how to, you know, use your body in a very powerful way. There's tremendous value in, in, in all of those things. But I never really encountered issues where those were the skills that I applied. And the skills that I applied were a lot of other, what I call um, uh, street dodges, and we'll get into those in a moment. Um, but instead of, you know, if, if, if a guy is like, you know, kind of targeting me on the train for one reason or another, the answer has never been a punch in the face or yelling at him. Um, you know, I've, I've, admitted, I've used other skills. And, you know, I've, I, when I created Asphalt, it was kind of reverse engineering and seeing what has worked in my life, what has not worked, um, and then talking to other people. Um, and, and really, I just found that what I call, again, mainstream self-defense, just it, it's, I'll just come right out and say it, there's a lot of fantasy land stuff going on there um, that's not really real. And in asphalt, my goal is to work with people who would never have otherwise traditionally taken what we think of as a traditional self-defense class. Um, I work with a wide range of people with physical abilities um, who, you know, maybe they're older and they just can't quite, you know, do the physical things. That doesn't mean that they can't be safe. That doesn't mean right, that they should, right. you know, that kind of thing. So I, I really kind of took a step back from uh, the, the mainstream view that you have to be a young, fit athlete to navigate your world safely. Um, but, you know, here are some things that you need to know. And pretty much the rest of the time, just sit back, like sit back and enjoy the, your life. I, I, it's a very city focused course. Of course, principles can apply anywhere. Um, but I, I have a bias towards cities and that <laughs> that's where the most fun is. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of opportunities are. Um, you know, everyone has different choice, life choices. Um, but I didn't really see anything out there for people, um, you know, really empowering people to just live their, their day-to-day -day life. It was more of like, oh my God, this bad thing's about to happen. How do I get out of it? Like physically. Um, so I wanted to fill that, fill that niche. That's, that is awesome. And that is a much needed 
uh, area that needs to be talked about, especially with people with who have never done anything like this before, or yeah. maybe somebody who has a disability that doesn't fit the average curriculum. So that's, that's awesome. So yeah, you mentioned... If, if I could just piggyback on that, you know, one of some of this has also, you know, been my own learning and failing in terms of, you know, I started getting into judo in the last several years and, and it, I turned 50 last month. And when I would go to competitions at age 48, 49, the only pe only women that were in my category were half my age. Mm. So I would compete against them. And that was a brutal lesson in what it's like to be in a 49, 50 year old body and I love that, right? Like, I think mm -hmm. training's fun. I think competition's oh, yeah. fun. Like, let's sure. go. It's fun. But the people that I feel like are most vulnerable to street level violence don't think that's fun, right? Like, they're mm. not going to do that. So if I know if I was struggling with my body and like, okay, you know, after a training session, I have to eat these certain things and I have to, you know, like the average person's not going to do that. Like, right. I'm weird. Like, I'm a weird 50-year-old lady who loves this. And most people aren't like that. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm glad that you love it. I think we can all tell that you are very passionate about what you're doing and what you're teaching. So you mentioned that you had moved out to Los Angeles. You live in Hollywood, which is, okay. I think you will say, a city like none other in the world. Um, give us a quick rundown of what it's like to live in Hollywood if you're not like an ultra rich movie star. Most of us don't know what that's like. Yeah, so I am not ultra rich nor a movie star. Um, Hollywood is interesting because it's... Um, when people say Hollywood, there's certain connotations that sure. that has, right? right? They think glamour, they think movies, they think rich, they think that kind of thing. Um, but the neighborhood itself is quite different than that kind of global glamorous image. I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce will not love hearing me say that, <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite different. Um, it's actually uh, quite a working class community. Um, mm -hmm. I live about a block and a half off of Hollywood Boulevard, the Walk of Fame blocks from the Chinese theater. Um, and so it's very tourist rich. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's everything. And then they'll obviously we're talking right now in the middle of a pandemic, the early uh, 2021, I think the year we're in. Yeah, um, <laughs> who knows? I can't give up. Right. Um, so there, there have definitely been changes and evolutions since in the past year with, with uh, the pandemic. Um, but prior, let's just kind of talk prior and we'll talk about like doing sure. and yeah, I don't have yeah. a crystal ball. We'll see what the future is. Um, yeah. But, you know, Hollywood has become my laboratory, really, if you will. You know, like I said, I kind of, you know, I lived in a smaller city before coming to L.A. I lived in Austin, Texas. And, you know, the rules, the general rules of self-defense worked for me pretty well there. Um, but there, it's, it's kind of a different game here. So I've used this as a, as a laboratory, if you will. And so some of the kind of factors um, are that... Um, you know, there's tens of millions of visitors traipsing through my neighborhood every year. They're from all over the globe. They're from every neighborhood in the United States, each with varying levels of awareness, each with varying levels of um, skill, just social skill. And like, how do you walk past a person and not be a jerk? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that, it's, it's pretty almost as basic as that. Um, the population, population density of this community, uh, my neighborhood is at 22,000 per square mile. It's pretty dense. Uh -huh. um, in, in my neighborhood, before COVID, I would walk and take the train to go downtown to work, which downtown is a whole other beast. We'll talk, we can talk about that if you want. Um, but I would pass by the two most dangerous intersections for pedestrians in the city. Um, and so it's not just, we always think about personal safety as, oh, the bad guy, but you know, there's right. cars you gotta watch out mm -hmm. for. Um, and then across the city, um, you know, we have over 220 languages spoken here. Our population of the homeless is right at around 59,000 uh, countywide. Um, LAPD, they get about 20,000 calls per year just for mental health crises alone. And that number is the tip of the iceberg. Like I've uh -huh. seen so much stuff that I know a call never got made. Uh, um, sure. So it's it's really I love the city. It's 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 fun. It's electric. Um, the vibe is definitely different now because of COVID. But it's 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 where I enjoy being. And it's you've got to be on your toes on one hand a little bit more, but you also have to relax a little more um, because of what we talked about earlier. Is if what worked for me in Austin or in, in other places, if I had that mindset here, I would be fried and frazzled at the end of the day. Like I would yeah. just yeah, be sure. done. And, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, 
whether you are walking down Hollywood Boulevard over the the famous you know Walk of Fame there, or if you're on Main Street USA, how can we as people moving in an environment, how can we discern what is actually a threat? So before we get to where we are on the street, I want to back it up a little bit, Andy. Okay. And there's there's two it's two parts to this answer, but they're very connected. The first part is that we are organisms that are wired for survival. Mm -hmm. um, our entire brain is like, that's the primary goal is survival and you know continuation of the species. So a lot of times I hear, I see a lot of stuff in self-defense where you gotta be on the lookout, you gotta keep your head on a swivel. And it's kind of like, calm down because we're already there, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's reasons and we'll get into why in a little bit of, of what can get in the way of you recognizing those things. But the first thing is we are wired. So you can kind of trust yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but the other side of that is that culturally we're primed for fear constantly, absolutely mm -hmm. constantly. You mm -hmm. can't turn on the news. You can't go right. through your social media feed yeah. um, without someone telling you you should be afraid of something, whether it's... I mean, it could be anything. Right. Um, and it's it, it, when, when we're primed for that fear, when we we're told we're, we see it, especially by experts in the self-defense field, then we just start to see it everywhere. And we think kind of everyone's after us. Um, but if you kind of circle back and you remember that you're wired for perceiving threat, then you can remember that your brain is actually your best weapon. And so... I'm going to talk about an ideal person. This ideal person is not me. <laughs> sure. It's probably not me either. Fine. <laughs> this ideal person takes really good care of their brain so that they can adequately perceive threat. So if we overstimulate our brain with threat everywhere, constantly be on the lookout, we actually, not only do we become less, we become worse at perceiving it because mm -hmm. everything looks like a threat, then nothing is a threat. We just can't discern it. But then we also lower our capacity to respond to the threat, because if we're constantly on a state of high alert, we're just, we're, that's where we are. If we, and we'll talk about some brain exercises momentarily, but if we can kind of like let the, the central nervous system chill, just chill down a little bit, we have more uh, resources available to us when something arises. So mm -hmm. when I talked earlier about, um, you know, a lot of the things that when I've, I've been able to use um, never came out of a Krav Maga class, right? It's, it's being able to enlist someone else to help me, or it, there's a lot of things, and we can talk about that more. Um, but those are the things that Asphalt's about, because I, I, I haven't seen anyone else talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but the ideal person. Um, so the ideal person is taking care of their brain, right? They mm -hmm. maybe limit their news to whatever a day, um, you know, an hour a day. They're very Not neutral. <laughs> yeah, the, I know, right? The very neutral websites, you know, avoid the inflammatory language. They're very careful. Maybe they don't have social media or they have it very carefully curated. Um, and that's that's not me, right? Like on some days I'm like that and on other right. days I'm like right. the world's ending and I must read every detail. Like I get uh -huh. it. I totally get it. But honestly, the best thing that we can do is to really step back from the noise and step back and see what's what's really real. Um, mm -hmm. because if we're primed for fear, by, like before we even leave our living room, when you step out in the street, it, it's just, that's not how I want to live my life. And that's what I'm trying to share with people is there's another way that you can be safe, that you can enjoy life and you can actually handle threats should they come up. And it's not, the, the answer is not being more fearful. Right. And it's like you you reach this point of diminishing return with hypervigilance yeah. to where yeah. you just you start harming yourself more than you're actually helping yourself. Yeah, totally get that. Well, and the flip side of that, too, is not only are you harming yourself. I just learned this uh, I was in a conversation with Dr. Stan Tatkin, who's a really brilliant neuro, a neuro uh, researcher. He enlightened me or maybe. Yeah, this was Stan. Um, we were talking about how the amygdala is the threat center mm -hmm. of the brain, but it's also, in order to survive, we seek out threats, but we also seek out opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so much the idea of opportunity is lost. We're always thinking about the threat because that's the immediate thing and it kind of makes sense. We're always thinking about it, but I'm also interested in the opportunity. So how can we uh, wire or harness that, that, um, 
that instinct to seek out opportunity. And so when we are constantly building up the muscle of the amygdala looking for threat, we're actually diminishing our capacity for the, the opportunity side of things, which um, is also covered by the amygdala that, that uh, manages things like our sex drive, that manages things uh, related to love and connecting with other people. Um, it manages um, what foods we're attracted to. It manages like just any visual thing that we're attracted right, okay. to. So we, we, we kind of lower, I, the audience can't see me. I'm doing this thing with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can watch it on YouTube. You can watch this on YouTube. Yeah, the, the, the seesaw of lowering, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, you're raising the threat, you're lowering that. So it's, it's you're, you're lowering your enjoyment and you're also increasing the fear, like you said, and then also absolutely we're decreasing the ability to recognize and decreasing our ability to, to, to respond appropriately. Right. You know, you, you've talked about you know, your students and having people in and, and, and talking about how we perceive things, you know, I know many of us have ideas about what might happen to us in a violent encounter and what violence would look like. Yeah. So how do we push past our preconceived notions to see what's really going on around us? Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things. I, I, one thing that I've been exploring a lot is the idea of top-down recognition of a threat. That's that's what's happening in our mind where, okay, that guy's coming at me with a knife. That's clearly a threat. I see all the visual cues. Um, there's the top-down recognition, and then there's the bottom-up recognition um, that is our survival brain that it just reacts, right? Like it's that feeling that we can't explain, but it's mm -hmm. talking to us. It's saying something's wrong, get out. Right. And so the more we um, support that um, that side, the bottom up side, the, the better off we get. Um, I, I want to touch briefly on the top down side. Um, I think your audience probably though is very um, much familiar perhaps with a sure. lot of these, mm -hmm. um, but they're really important, right? Because if we don't, if, if, if there's something going on, we're out and about and we, we can't recognize the pattern, there might be a tendency to freeze or not know what to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's valuable to understand like, okay, you know, uh, things like situational proximity, like what's normal in this time and place for a person to be close to me. Like if I'm on an empty train, it's weird that that guy comes and sits right yeah. next to me. Not so weird if it's full, right? So kind of understanding those distinctions. Um, you know, the patterns of victim grooming, whether that is, you know, as parents, those are Think those are things that they should learn to rec recognize and be able to talk to their kids about. So there's all those top-down patterns um, that personally I think should be in school and we should just know, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think your audience is, is pretty familiar with perhaps a lot of that. Um, but what I'm talking about is, is the, the flip side of that, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I can recognize it, but what am I gonna do about it? Like, what is my primitive brain? Because if those two are like not communicating, if the, if the thinking and the survival brain are not thinking and they're not talking, you're kind of gonna be, you won't maybe um, handle that as well as, as you could have. Um, so a couple of exercises that I recommend, I work with folks, again, who are in very dense urban environments who, um, how do I say this? It's, um, <laughs> we're not in combat here, but it's like, there's a lot of input, right? There's a sure. lot of input. And so that's why I really kind of push against, and, and you have had, you know, I've had this conversation. I kind of pick on the suburbs a little bit. It's like, you know, <laughs> advice that comes from the suburbs, like that, like that can kind of work if there's really no threat, but you can't live your life that way mm -hmm. in a really like uh, input rich environment. Right. So what I, what I do is and when I work with like shopkeepers um, along Hollywood Boulevard, when I work with people who have to take the train is one of the things we do is we work on just like calming down the nervous system because they have been out in it every day. If I'm working with someone who manages a store a souvenir shop on 7-Eleven, you know, I may have seen some stuff that day, but they've like really seen some stuff like all day, mm -hmm. every day. And then they have to go home and live their life. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that they, that we go over are um, just that idea of sitting quietly and the idea of listening just for a few minutes and paying attention to your environment. If you can close your eyes, that's even better. Um, and just kind of get used to embracing your environment that way. And then if you can do that in a quiet place, that's great. The next step would be to do that in a more noisy place. And so you're letting your body just listen for a moment. Act, to acclimate to what's going on. To acclimate to what's going on and to understand it. And to just, there's really no thought process that you're trying to get to. 
um, it's just letting your, get that part of the brain do its job and mm -hmm. not interfere. The next step to this, and this is one of my favorite exercises, is to sit quietly and to um, both feet on the floor, close your eyes, and just start to pay attention to your body. Maybe, you know, you're a little tense in your shoulder, your jaw, that kind of thing. And then after a moment, do the, do the exercise we did before, is, start, is to direct your attention outside of yourself. Listen to the noise. Maybe it's the refrigerator humming or a bird outside. And then bring your attention back into your body. And then pay attention to what you're, you're feeling in your body. And then after a moment or two, take it back outside. So you're shuttling back and forth. And so the idea, and I love this exercise, is because we could so often as we're running around, getting groceries, picking up kids, you know, running to catch the bus, you know, whatever it is we're doing, um, we, we get in our head and there's a way, the second exercise is a way of training your body so that you're both in and out of your head at the same time, if that makes sense. Okay. And it's not a, um, necessarily a conscious thing that your brain is doing in terms of it, it, that, that's the book that's the thing like the primal brain is nonverbal, right like it can't mm -hmm. necessarily express why you get that weird feeling in your stomach right, right. when you see that creepy person mm -hmm. you just get that feeling so it's it's a way of connecting those two parts of the brain and just strengthening that connection um and then the third exercise and i really love this and people um the last time i was i was talking about this in a podcast the guy he, he loved it but he was teasing me he's like that is so la <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to do this but the idea and this comes from um i think this comes from th those two exercises come from dr elizabeth stanley who this is her book right here widen the window can't recommend mm -hmm. it enough um but dr stan Hotkin has an exercise this is more for couples um so when you come home at the end of the day um and you, maybe your partner's there maybe they're not there but when you come and you reunite it's important to stop for whatever it is you're doing. And if the kids are there, the dogs are there, whatever, set them aside for a moment and to go belly to belly with your partner and hug. <laughs> and this is the craziest self-defense right? self-defense advice, right? The reason this is important, and I know your, your audience is gonna be like, what is she talking about? The reason this is important, this is downgrading or down regulating your nervous system. Because if you come in from out there and you come home and you're still carrying that around, not only is it going to affect your your home life, you're going to take it with you the next day. So it's really important to resync um, what you're doing in terms of your relationships, um, but even just just for yourself, very selfishly. And this is something that I've gotten great feedback on um, from people who again um, run stores along the boulevard. Is you know they they just deal with crap all day, and and like you've got to be able to come home and and t and your body needs to know it's safe because if you never turn that switch off you're going to be worse tomorrow um, right. in terms of, uh, you know, maybe they dealt with someone who tried to, you know, set their t-shirt stand on fire that day. Well, you know, they got to come home and, and, and turn that off because they got to go back and deal with it again tomorrow. And the, the stronger that their regulations, um, so uh, uh, the, their nervous system can be, the better that they will be at being able to uh, manage those things as they arise. Because they, a lot of times we want really cookie cutter approaches to self-defense. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone does this, you do that. And then I do that. Right. Exactly. Right. And really the key in, in such an, a chaotic and often chaotic and an un, un, um, predictable environment is you just have to be open and you have to roll with it. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if your nervous system is just through the roof. Right. You know, I like your exercise number three. I know you, um, you, Somebody said that's very LA, but I mean, I, I heard this and said, when you, when you come home, hug your family, you know, yes, you know yeah. bring that, bring that down, bring that stress level down. That's yeah. probably going to make for a more harmonious household as well. Yeah. Cause I know how yeah. many times do you come home as, as an adult and you take your, you know, frustrations out, you know, on your kid over the fact that, you know, they spilled their milk or your, your, your wife comes home a few minutes later, like, Hey, where you been? That sort of stuff. And there's an right. argument. I think, I think hugging it out is not a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's grounded again in neuroscience. It's what it does to your body. Um, the, the direction from Dr. Tadkin is to actually hug each other until you feel that, you know, you may not mm. actually sigh, but until your body does that. And that is your body. It, again, it's not a verbal thing. It's your body saying, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. It's okay. This person is safe. This environment is safe. Because if you never give yourself 
that place to be safe, you can't go out again tomorrow and mm-hmm. do what you need to do, whether it's just go to the grocery store. Um, and that's, that's why, you know, again, we've been talking about fear here and a kind of maybe this sounds maybe a little bit different for your listeners to hear. Um, but, you know, we, we just are on this like hamster wheel of fear. And I'm encouraging folks to get off because mm-hmm. it's not, you're not going to hear from me one more tactic to recognize the bad guy. Like we've got enough tactics out there. There's like more than enough experts out there ready to tell you that. And I'm asking you to step back, trust yourself and take a breath. Got it. That sounds good. You know, I follow you on Instagram. I read your blog. Um, you have shared some interesting stories on my podcast the last time you were here. But can you tell us about the time when you were in the process of threat discernment and how that panned out for you? How, what's the time that you know that like, hmm, something's going on here and how do I need to act next? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a number of stories. Yeah, um, and again, keep in mind, this is a family show. Okay. Family show, so. Okay, good. That does yeah. narrow it down. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, I, and I want to preface this by saying, you know, I, we've been talking about like, you know, kind of some off the wall things in terms of what we think of self-defense. Um, I have experienced violence. I have had Mm -hmm. hands go on me. I've, I've laid hands on, um, but more often than not, I've dodged what we've, I've talked about street dodges. I've dodged Mm -hmm. trouble and it's, it's by kind of practicing some of the things we've talked about and, and having that full awareness. Um, and the story I want to share with you happened, um, early in the pandemic, early in, um, when things were shut, it was shortly after everything got shut down on Hollywood Boulevard and, um, there was like, it was a, it was a ghost town. It was surreal. And, um, there were, you know, a handful of tourists who you just felt bad for, cause you know, they got stranded. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and, and the, and the folks who were out on the street have been living on the street and they had been living for a long time. It was a really surreal time because they had always been there and I'd always seen them. But at this point, that's all pretty much all who was left. So it was like, um, it was like Dante's Inferno out there for a while. Um, and so one day I, um, to keep my sanity, I, I, um, then and now go for walks, excuse me, um, go for walks, go to my rooftop garage and and work out and and keep my sanity that way. And one day I was, I went for a walk and I was walking on the boulevard. Um, actually I, I walked in the boulevard, went to a really cute little neighborhood with very leafy green trees. It was really beautiful. Loved it. And as I was coming home, I was walking back on the boulevard and I'd stopped um, to take a look at the Chinese theater across the street. And it was just surreal, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like the apocalypse had happened. Like here's this world famous landmark and no one's around. Right. That's gotta be and, weird. Yeah. Yeah. It was really weird. So, so I'm looking at that and then I'm ready to move on. And I, I look up and I see three young men who um, appeared to be tourists. And the first thing on my mind was they did what all tourists do on the Walk of Fame is they walk really wide and they're looking at the stars in the Walk of Fame and, and they're taking up the whole sidewalk and it's like just what tourists do. And in, in pre-COVID land, like who cares? Um, but in COVID, it's like, oh, how am I going to get around these guys? Because, you know, COVID and we're still learning and like all this uh-huh. stuff. And so they're walking in my direction. And my, my first instinct is to walk like out on the curb to avoid them. But I saw this guy who was in the street walking in our direction and he looked very bedraggled is that a word <laughs> he looked i understand exactly what you mean <laughs> it said it means what it said it sounds right like what it yeah. sounds like <laughs> so he 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 had been living on the street for quite some time he was in his 20s i would guess um but it was looking really rough so like it, the second i saw him i knew okay i'm not walking on the curb Um, and so I looked back, my glance back to these guys and I'm like, what am I going to do? And then the decision was made for me. I heard this like primal scream come out of this guy who was walking in our direction, the bedraggled looking guy. And I looked at him and he just looked me in the eyes and he's like, bitch. And, oh, sorry. You said this is a family No, no, no. That's okay. (laughs) I I remember reading the (laughs) story on Instagram uh, when you shared it. I was like, oh my goodness. You know, like this dude is just outright made eye contact with you, targeted you and called you a bad name. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, and I, and, and I just kind of froze for like half a second and I looked at him and 
it's, it's something I would always repeat in every single self-defense class, whether it's a traditional one, whether it's asphalt, is distance is your best friend. And that was never more true than in the time of COVID, right? So here's this guy who, and um, my husband got pictures of him later and, and pictures I've shared. I mean, God bless him. He looks like he has been living on the issues. street and picked yeah. and picked up all kinds of diseases that might be, you know, like mm. those are the reasons to not go hands on, right? Like if, if, yeah. if, if, if yeah. I don't want hep A or whatever I could might pick up. So he's coming at me. He screams that at me. I didn't know the guy. It wasn't personal. Right. Right? It's like, right. I don't know. He didn't know me. I don't know him. So he's coming in my direction and there's these three guys coming and I just froze for a second. And I looked at the three guys. I said, could I walk with you? And mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, sure. And I, I get goosebumps thinking about it. And so there was three of them, the one in the middle, I walked side by side with, and then the two and the others kind of flanked a bit. And the guy, it, it was literally like we were a herd of gazelles or whatever. And, and he was the lion and he was circling us and just looking, I was the target. Like I was the mm -hmm. one who had like the, 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 the newborn baby or the one with the broken leg or whatever. And he was circling and the guys on the end, bless their heart, they didn't really catch this part because as he would circle and get on my side, I would like zig to be on the other side of the guy that was I was talking to in the middle. So I, every time I like had him between us um, because I was the target, he was not. And so it was just this game of like cat and mouse while I'm in the circle while I'm thinking, I don't know if these three guys have COVID. <laughs> um, I've got this psychopath like ch charging me down. And then what was the, there was a third element. Um, oh, and, and my intention was as I'm walking with these gentlemen to, and I say gentlemen in every sense of the word, they were just so kind. <laughs> they could have said mm -hmm. no <laughs> um, when I asked to walk with them. Um, and so uh, as we're, we're walking and talking, I, I, it was very purposely with the guy in the middle Oh, where are you from? Oh, how long are you? Like just making the mm -hmm. most boring, dumb, small talk because I, <laughs> I didn't want it to escalate. Like I didn't want the fear sure. to overwhelm sure. the group. Doesn't mean I was, I mean, I had the guy, like he never lost my, left my sight line of vision. Like I had my eyes on him the whole time. Um, but I was like, it was like the internal and external, like that whole different thing happening, right? Like the, 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 um, the, that primitive brain was like physically moving. It was managing my body, keeping uh, uh, that distance. The, the, um, the, the more um, civilized brain was having a conversation with these guys trying to like manage it. And um, this went on for a good block and the guy kept mm. circling. And then we got to like the end of the next block and he, he walked ahead of us. He kind of kept walking for a little bit, kept my eye um, and we slowed our walk. So we didn't like catch up to him. And then he eventually went down a corner and turned and I thanked the kind young men profusely. And then I just went home and it, it was a very, very scary experience. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but I share that in, in this conversation about fear. Um, I, I was very clearly targeted by that guy, right? There was mm -hmm. like yeah. zero doubt on what to mm -hmm. do. Um, but the choices available to me weren't what I would have, what we traditionally learn in say a traditional self-defense class. I was not letting that guy get anywhere near me. I'm, I wasn't going to throw a punch. I wasn't going to do a groin kick because it would have, none, none of that would have been pretty. Um, but instead it was, you know, enlisting these kind young men to, to, to walk with me and, and they graciously did. Um, and it was, you know, if, if you asked me, you know, at the time or even now, um, and, and I always write these things down after they happen because, you know, when you're under duress like that, memories change at each time you tell mm -hmm. them. So I try to, yes. try to try to go, you know, what, what happened at the time? I mean, the main thing on my mind, on my conscious mind was to keep distance, keep distance, keep distance. Um, the other thing was to just like not let him out of my sight and then to also keep talking like normal. So those were the conscious things that were happening. Um, I would say that the, the, the I don't want to call it a dance, but it was, it was literally a dance I was doing moving around this circle um, just to, to maintain that, that overall all goal. Um, so yeah, we, I think it was within the next few days um, I was out with my husband and um, we saw him mm -hmm. across the street. <laughs> he didn't see me or recognize me. I made myself very obscure and Brian, my husband got some pictures and we kind of kept an eye on him for a couple of weeks. And, and, you know, we saw his, his state of mind and body degrade over time. And I feel very lucky, you know, who knows 
what was going on with him, but it was, it was a, it was a close call for sure. Right. I remember when you posted a picture of the guy and I thought, yeah, yeah I would be freaked out too. If this happened to me, you know, yeah. that, yeah. that guy coming after you. Yeah. That's yeah. uh, uh you, you, you never know. Um, we've talked a lot about fear. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit more here. You know, fear motivates everybody. How can yeah. we separate fact from fear? I, I think, Andy, that really comes down to applying critical thinking skills. And, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, we're primed for fear. There's no shortage of folks out there wanting to, you know, they're making money off of clicks, literally, mm -hmm. um, of mm -hmm. clicks of every time we, we, we um, you know, it triggers our fear. Well, I got to find out what happened. Um, so really, you know, we, 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 when we apply our critical thinking skills, if someone's telling me a story, whether they're sharing, a, uh, whether it's the, the media or a person, you know, ask yourself, why are they telling me this? What is their motivation for telling me this? Do they have something to sell me? Are, are they using fear to sell me something? Are they using fear to motivate me for something? Honestly, are they working out their own issues? Um, I, I'm going to say it. I feel like in the self-defense world, it's kind of like a lot of fearful people. And a lot of them are working out their own stuff. And, you know, if they can help other people, that's great. But I think at the same time, there's a lot of folks who are still figuring it out and um, they're just working out their own issues. And I don't want to get caught up in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and also think, you know, what is that person's expertise who is sharing this? Um, I had written an article recently and you and I had connected about where um, a friend of mine, Elaine, who is this like, she's a colleague of mine and mm -hmm. we hopped on a work call and she said, Beverly, um, I, I, so I have another day job and, but she hopped on a, a, a day, uh, a call with me and she's like, Beverly, I need to take one of your self-defense classes. And I was like, why, what's going on? And she said, I saw this post on Instagram and it, it was this video of this person getting attacked. And the message was that, you know, most people don't go around attacking people and, and, and we abide by social scripts, but you never know when people are going to go off that script. And, and I really want to take a class with you. And I was really surprised that my friend Elaine, um, it, it, actually, as I'm saying this, it, it, this is getting deeper about the fear. She's a, um, she's an, has advanced degrees. She's a clinical psychologist. She works with people, right? You think someone like that would be immune to kind of mm -hmm. quick baby fear. Sure. Um, but this triggered her, like it triggers all of us. And I had known a good bit about Elaine because I work with her and I'm not against her at all taking like a self-defense class, mm -hmm. whether it's for me or anybody. But the fact that that was her motivation really concerned me. And so my concern in that moment was, well, Elaine, you've told me, we've, tra we've traded war stories, right? Like, I don't know if I told her the story that I just shared with you, but we've, her and I have traded war stories and she's had some war stories that she's effectively mitigated. And I said, Elaine, um, you, you've done that before. The, the very thing that you're afraid of, you, you've managed that. I, and, and I said something, I can't remember what it was. And then she started telling me another story about, yeah, I was, you know, this, I was late at night, warehouse district, coming home, guy started following me. And, and I can't remember all the details. It was, it was a good story. I was just so caught up. And, but, but she basically let the guy know she's a hard target and he went on his way and she made it home safely. Good for her. And yeah, and she, and she did that and she was successful. And, and, and I was like, look, you and I, we, we'll do self-defense anytime, but please don't do it out of fear. You are smart. You know how to do it. And the flip side of that is, is I know the person who made that post is kind of the opposite of Elaine who had the fear. The person who made the post actually um, doesn't have the world savviness that I know Elaine has. She, I know for a fact that she, um, you know, lives in a very small community that she um, is, uh, how do I say it? Um, what, I was on a travel show with her once and, and she, she, her, her advice was just frankly kind of bad. And she had like been to very few places. And, and, and it was just, I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of parsing my words because I don't want to pick on people, but it, at the same time, really like who was doing the talking? Do they actually know more than you? And in this case of my friend Elaine, that person didn't know anything on what Elaine had. And that's the problem with, um, I think, the internet. When we want to try to discern fact from fear, we can't really do that because um, we can't fill in the blanks. We just see a post. And if it triggers our fear, we're just going to gobble it up. And if we can apply that critical thinking and ask those questions, 
who, who is this person? What is their motivation? Why are they telling me this? Are they really experts? Um, that, that's going to go a long way. Um, another point on that is, you know, the first one, I guess, is considering the source. The second one is reading past the headlines. Again, nobody makes money in the news business unless you click on it. Well, I don't want to say nobody. <laughs> big, big, big industry or big, big companies, you know, will get sub subscription fees and things like that. But mostly, you know, it's, it's all about the clicks. Um, and so, you know, read past the headlines. I saw a headline floating around recently and it was, let me see, I wrote it down. Um, 33 missing children rescued in Los Angeles trafficking operation. Okay. And so I read that headline and then I read the article and it turns out that eight of the children of the 33, it, it, it sounded like it was this massive, like, um, child trafficking ring. Some of those kids were, you know, abducted by parents. Some of them were runaways. Eight of them, and, and clearly this is eight too many, were caught up in a trafficking ring. Clearly eight too many. But when you see that headline, it tells a different story than when you go in and read the details of the story. And so, you know, if we're considering the source, knowing what their motivations are, reading past the headlines. And then a third thing is to identify problems that are specific to you. So if we see a news story, really ask, you know, is that, does that apply to my life? You know, am I in that environment? Am I dealing with those kinds of situations? Um, know what your victim profile is. If you mm -hmm. are a 20 something college student female, it's gonna be very different than someone who is transgendered person of color uh, going to a nightclub, right? Very different. So know what your victim profile is and understand that not everything applies to you. Um, and then the last, uh, actually I have two more. Um, one is to identify your biases, your mm -hmm. own biases mm -hmm. when you hear a story. Um, but also that of the person, like you don't know what their biases are. Um, are they getting paid to tell you this story? Is this, you know, again, <laughs> newspaper publishing, I'm, I'm picking on those guys, um, but for good reason. Um, but then also look at our own biases. Um, if if for, this is a question for your audience, if you close your eyes and I say the phrase bad neighborhood, what's the picture that automatically comes up in your head? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be, you know, a, a picture that is particular to you and your circumstances and what you think of as a bad neighborhood. Um, and I, that's a question I get quite a bit in asphalt anthropology. Well, you know, how do you identify a bad neighborhood or what do you do in a bad neighborhood? All this stuff about bad neighborhoods. And how I lead that off is I've sat on curbs in South Central Los Angeles eating tacos with the locals while they sipped gin out of salsa cups and had a wonderful time. They were kind, they were pleasant, they were lovely. And I was less at risk in that environment than when I was a kid going to frat parties at 18, 19 years old. So when you think about what is a bad neighborhood, again, what is your victim profile? Nobody gave a darn about me, you know, when I was mm. sitting there eating tacos, I treated people with respect. Um, I was kind, polite, ate my food and left. You know, as a 20 or 19, 18, 19 year old, it's very, it, you know, I'm talking about myself at different ages, but it's very different. So if you think you know what a bad neighborhood is, re I invite you to rethink that. And I invite you to rethink that for yourself, but also, you know, for your kids in terms of, you know, are you implanting a bias onto what a bad, what a bad neighborhood is or who constitutes a bad neighborhood? Um, so those are our own biases and we're all, we're all think working and figuring those out. Um, and then the last point I have uh, to your question is balance anecdotal information with a broader analysis. So I can sit here and tell you war stories, but that doesn't really mean anything in the context of a larger statistical view of something. Um, one time I was um, on the train again, pre-COVID, um, I was on the train and these three young men got lost. They were in their 20s. They were from Italy, all very gorgeous and buff and, and they... <laughs> And they're very, they, they, they got lost. They missed their exit or they missed their, whatever. They, they, they missed something. And I, a guy came over to them and was like selling something. And I could just see their eyes get really wide. They got really nervous. And when the, when the vendor walked away, um, I, I can't remember how, somebody said something. I said something to them or them to me. And I wound up helping them get to where they needed to go. But when we're talking, the one guy was like, aren't you afraid to be on the train? And because he was a tourist and he had heard terrible things sure, about the metro. Right. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm fine. And, and they just couldn't believe it. And 
I, and, and I was, I was shocked by their fear. Right. And as mm-hmm. we talked, you know, I think two of them worked out in jujitsu, like they were athlete, all this stuff. And I'm like, why are these 20 something year old dudes like afraid of the train? It's because of what someone had told them, their friends had told them the train is bad. My advice to these young men was, cause they wanted to go to the uh, walk of fame, Hollywood Boulevard. You're going to have fun, be nice, be polite. The most trouble you can get into is if you go to a bar, you get drunk and you get rolled or you get into a fight nobody's going to mess with like these like built stud dudes on the train, right? Like I've had, you know, situations on the train that they would never be at risk for. So, you know, their friends had told them all these horror stories. And when I drilled in with them, it was young women that were telling them these stories. And it's like, oh, okay, not a great source. Like maybe if those young women were telling other young women, maybe there's something there. So, you know, we pass along stories that you know, are tainted by our own bias. They're tainted by our own point of view. Um, Not to say that anecdotes aren't helpful. They add color, they add dimension to the boring statistics that, you know, I I defer to. Um, Mm -hmm. And and they can be very helpful. We learn as human beings through story. But, you know, if we rely on that as the truth, we're only getting one person's point of view. Yeah, and and that's true because there's a lot of times we can learn from somebody else's story, but it's not always applicable to every situation you can't take that one story in that one moment and apply it to every second of your life henceforward you know right 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 yeah, yeah. and and that that's something I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I, I know I've I've uh, been having some other conversations and posts on Instagram and you know I, I kind of uh, been on a bender lately about you know why why is it that like it's military and law enforcement that's the expert in self-defense like because I'm not going around kicking in doors like I don't need those mm-hmm. skills and, um, you know, I, I want to stress, we have something that we can learn. Everyone has something we can teach. They can teach us. Mm-hmm. Everyone has something they can teach us and be specific to what that is. Right. Like my friend, Elaine, she's traveled the world. She has, you know, dual citizenship among countries. She's like pretty darn street savvy. And, you know, someone else who maybe has, um, you know, a more low key suburban life, they've got things that, that they can teach, you know, any as well. But let's be specific. So I think, you know, kind of to circle back to your original question is how do you discern fear? It's, it's like, get really particular, get, you know, use that critical thinking. Right. You know, critical thinking is very important because a lot of times we just want to immediately shove threat into either box A, B, or C. And so my action is X, Y, and Z. So it always has to be this way. You know, uh, by the way, I want to follow up with something. You have used the term that I love twice here, and that is a street dodge. Tell everybody what a street dodge is. Oh, yeah, I did promise that, didn't I? Okay. So street dodges are collections of things that I do um, to create distance. So this was long before physical uh, distancing and social distancing. I'm like an expert, like I can be in the city and I can keep people away from me because I just, <laughs> it's my thing. Yeah. Um, so a street dodge is, is a range of skills. Um, so one particular street dodge that is probably the most popular that people love when you're walking down a crowded environment, um, or it's really great for your Maybe you're being incredibly situationally aware or you, and, and this has happened many times, you come around a corner and there's someone super sketch there. I just go back with my arm and I fix my ponytail. So I've got my elbow right here on my face. Um, and, and, and I have a hard time talking about this particular crime because it, it sounds like fear mongering, but this has actually happened in my neighborhood. So this is why it's important that I share it with my students is that whole sucker punch, right? You come around the corner and someone sucker punches you Mm -hmm. and so it's this this elbow is like it gets people out of your way you come up and it looks does it look i'm not like doing a crime no no that looks normal it's like i'm doing this right it's like i'm just kind of like fixing my ponytail or you know maybe fixing my shirt or whatever so that's a street dodge um a a great street dodge pick this up again you know real the streets get really crowded um just to walk the curb just to, to to avoid folks like that um, and really just to, to walk the edges. I, I, I've got a video, and you've probably have seen it, where, and this was back pre-COVID, I missed the world before COVID. <laughs> yeah, um, right. <laughs> we all do. Um, where, you know, I'm crossing Hollywood Highland, which is this insanely busy mecca of tourists. And I stand with my camera and I'm in the middle of the crowd. And I've got all these people around me. First of all, I'm a very impatient person and it drives me totally crazy to be that trapped. Um, uh-huh. But it takes forever. And so then... 
it's bad enough in the street, but then you get to the sidewalk where it bottlenecks because there's building and you're trapped. So then the second part of the video is I'm on the outside. And so I just skim around. And by the time I get to the sidewalk, the people that are behind me are like well behind me, that crowd that I would have otherwise been trapped in. So those are some examples of street dodges. It's how to navigate um, people, how to navigate dense crowds and how to, um, what I like about them is if you practice them enough, they become embodied and you don't think about them. It took me a while to reverse engineer them and remember that I actually did these things. They were unconscious. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up in a very dense urban environment, uh, although I, you know, most of my adult life I, I was out of that. But like, I kind of reverted back to being 10, 11, 12 and kind of, you know, going on in on the train to Philly and like, what are these things I would do? And so once you, you get them in your body, what I love about them is you kind of forget about them. Um, right. and but so they're it's, there when you need them. But they're there when you need them. And so it's not that constant checklist um, mm -hmm. of things that I have to remember because people are busy. Mm -hmm. Like people who have kids and jobs and homeschooling now and like all this stuff, even though life is kind of dialed down, people are still have a lot on their mind. Just going to the grocery store is a big thing. And I can't remember a checklist of things to do, but if you can embody these street dodges, you know, just making space and just knowing how to like see the crowd go the other way, use the magic elbow, how to take someone else's back if they get a little sketchy, that's another favorite. So th those are those are what I, I prefer. Okay, so what I've heard is that you are telling me that I need to grow a ponytail so that I can yes. put my- I you need Make a man bun is man what bun. you need as a man, man bun. bun. <laughs> yes. If you want, I'll send you, I have, I put together a compilation of a bunch of street dodges on video so I can send those to you if you want to put sure, them. Sure. Yeah. We can link that in the article. Okay. That's no problem. Right. Beverly, okay. thank you so much for your time. I've had a lot of fun. It's, it's been good to talk to somebody who is engaging in critical thinking because that is always needed. Tell everybody here, how can they find out more about you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty active on Instagram at asphalt underscore anthropology. Um, follow me there. Let's have conversations. Um, I That's the only social media. Well, I'm on Twitter, but I don't do anything on Twitter. I need to get better at that. Um, so if you're on Twitter and, and you want to say hi, that's cool too. Um, but really Instagram's where I'm at. Um, I have a website called Metro Finish School, as in Metropolitan Finishing School. Um, you can go there. I encourage folks to sign up for my newsletter every month. I have an article where we talk about um, whether it's mindset, whether it's uh, street dodges, but it's about, you know, these things of asphalt anthropology and, and moving through your world in a really joyful, bold, and fearless way. That is awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Beverly. Thank you.